Welcome to Family History Mysteries, a podcast that tells the stories uncovered through family history research, the unexpected stories of everyday people. I am an avid family historian who has been compiling my family tree for over 15 years, with nearly 20,000 people recorded in my trees. Episode 40, The Lady Swindler. Mary Ann McAfee, as Mary Robinson popped up in an interesting article in 1883 in the Deniliquin Pastoral Times when the law caught up with her for obtaining goods and money under false pretenses. She was aged 23. She was described as a girl in the articles. I suppose it was rare for a woman to be on the run in those days. Little did I know when I came across this small article that it was to unfold a long list of misdemeanours by this woman. Mary McAfee was born in 1860 in Glasgow, Scotland. She arrived in Australia on the Oaklands in 1879 from Glasgow, leaving on the 19th of June and arriving at Port Adelaide on the 18th of September. She was listed as a domestic servant. By the 23rd of April 1881, Mary was wanted by the police in Victoria. It was reported in the Victorian Police Gazette that Mary stole clothing from William Wilson from 4 Charles Street, Carlton, on the 6th of April 1881. And it says Mary McAfee is charged on warrant from stealing clothing from Mr William Wilson, Carlton. Description, about 24 years of age, 5 foot 2 or 3 inches high, slender build, very dark complexion, hair and eyes, sometimes has her hair in curls and other times in a knob, wears a long black jacket, merino, trimmed with black silk and a seaweed fringe, black hat with red tip, black merino dress and high button boots. Maybe at Emerald Hill, Carlton or Hotham. The property stolen consisted of two dresses, a petticoat, a night dress and a jacket, which have been traced, and a silver open-faced Geneva watch and a black silk guard. And then on the 29th of April 1881, so six days later, again in the Police Gazette, William Wilson's watch and locket have been recovered, pledged at Carlton and traced to Mary McAfee. It mentions on the 6th of May 1881, Mary McAfee for larceny from William Wilson has been arrested by the Melbourne Detective Police. She was sent to jail on the 13th of May 1881 on two counts of larceny and received six months jail time. She stated in the jail records that she was born in 1860 in Glasgow and that she was a music teacher. She was released from jail on the 20th of October, 1881. A month later, she was again arrested at Terelgan in Victoria for obtaining money under false pretenses under the alias of Maggie Stewart. She was removed to Melbourne. And the article outlining this case was on the 24th of November, 1881. It's titled A Female Imposter. The usual dull routine of life at Warrigal was varied during the past week by an event which has seen since been the theme of a many a jest. An imposter named Mary McAfee came amongst us with all the airs and graces of a lady, except in some few particulars, as her detractors now say, and took up abode at the club hotel where she managed to ingratiate herself with some of the gentlemen boarders, whose only cause of complaint against her seemed to be that she put on too much side. She stated that she was the niece of Mrs Strong, wife of Reverend C. Stronger of Melbourne, and that Dr Stewart of Ormond College was her brother, of whom she constantly spoke of as Sandy. She contracted a liability of 30 shillings at the club, which was as far as Mr Brace would let her go. He therefore gave her a quiet but unmistakable hint to leave by ordering the servant in her presence to clean out the room she'd occupied. Two of her gentlemen friends, whose names must not be divulged, accompanied her to the railway station where, unknown to them, she took a second-class ticket to sale, but afterwards exchanged it to Moe. During her stay here, she was introduced to Mr Porter, travelling agent for an insurance company, who at once wrote to Dr Stewart about his sister, in inverted commas. It was owing to this letter that the detectives were put upon Mary McAfee's track, as it appeared that she was wanted for obtaining money by means of false pretenses in Melbourne, 
where according to our Melbourne contemporaries, she's led rather a checkered career since she was liberated from prison a few weeks ago, after finishing a sentence for a similar offence. In Sale, which was the first place she visited in Gippsland, she caused the railway officials a lot of trouble by reporting that she had lost her portmanteau. She tried the same game at Warrigal, but Mr Maud referred her to the police, and as Constable Egan was not to be had by her special story, but went about business in a practical way, she did not trouble him much. At Warrigal, she sat on a kerosene tin opposite the club hotel, pretending to make a sketch of the building, but when she returned after half an hour's work, she had a blank piece of cardboard. Perhaps she thought she might get a commission with something on account to sketch the Guardian office. But if so, she was doomed to disappointment, as was our own artist who passed by three times while she was seated on the kerosene tin to have a look at her drawing, which she carefully prevented him from seeing. At the club hotel, she sat down to the piano to play and got up again, saying she could not play without music. In fact, she appeared to be a fraud in every way. After getting on her track in Gippsland, the police were not long in effecting her arrest, which was accomplished at Morwell to which place she proceeded after leaving Warrigal. At Morwell, she managed to ingratiate herself with Mrs Fitzpatrick, a kind-hearted hostess of Fitzpatrick's hotel, and it was at her house that Constable Kilfeder arrested the adventuress after receiving a telegram from Constable Egan, to whom the warrant for the apprehension was sent. The telegraph gives Detective O'Donnell all the credit for her capture, but as a matter of fact, the detective police did not know what had become of the lady till Dr Stewart put them on the scent in consequence of Mr Porter's letter. The offence for which she was arrested was committed on the 3rd and the warrant for the arrest issued on the 18th, between which dates the detectives must have been ignorant of her whereabouts. On the 29th of November 1881, a follow-up article with some more detail is titled A Youthful Female Imposter. It is rarely that a girl 19 years of age exhibits such cleverness in imposing upon people as did a Miss Mary McAfee, a governess, on whom some persons in Melbourne, Williamstown and Gippsland. The Melbourne Telegraph gives the following account of the young lady's proceedings. She is the same female who some months ago was arrested while holding the position of a nurse at the Melbourne Hospital and brought before the city court bench had sent to prison for a term of larceny. That was soon after her arrival in the colony from the mother country and it was elicited during the police court investigation that she had robbed her fellow shipmates while on the voyage out. Several weeks ago, her term of imprisonment having expired, she was liberated and proceeded to practice the unblushing frauds for which she was last night locked up by Detective O'Donnell, who was instrumental in tracing her to Gippsland and having her arrested by the local police there. Choosing for the scene of her operations, Williamstown, she represented to the Reverend Mr Evans, Baptist Minister at the fishing village, that she was a niece to Mrs Strong, wife of the well-known minister of Scots Church, Collins Street, and that she was sojourning at the seaside for the benefit of her health. And she was welcomed and entertained by Mr Evans's family with all due hospitality. She visited the city and obtained from Mr Ford, late Robertson, bookseller of Collins Street, a number of works which she had sent to Williamstown and presented to the Reverend Mr Evans for the Sunday school attached to his church. Taking good care to repeat the story of her relationship to everyone she came in contact with, she easily obtained credit from Mr Ford and was invited by that gentleman to his residence at South Yarra, where she was introduced to the female members of his family and made welcome. Her audacity appears to be without parallel, and to this juncture she claimed a fresh relationship, that of sister to Mr Stuart M.A., a master at Ormond College, and suggested to Mr Ford's sister that they should accompany her on a visit to Mr Stuart. Her invitation was accepted, and in company with the Mrs Ford, she proceeded to the college. Leaving her friend outside the building, she went in, and after a brief interval, rejoined them. She next obtained a hat and other articles from Miss Ghent, milliner of Collins Street. She again made her way to Williamstown, where she entered the family of Captain Maynard as a nursery governess, and repetition of her story respecting her Presbyterian relatives, again standing her in good stead. At this stage, the most remarkable part of the narrative occurs. Her bona fides were doubted by a young lady, who was not slow to give expression to her suspicion, but who was threatened for slander by McAfee, who actually waited on Mr Kidston, the solicitor at his office, for the purpose of having a letter sent to the young lady. By this time, the day after Melbourne Cup Day, 
Mrs. Strong had been made aware of the imposter's movements and singularly enough entered Mr. Kidson's office while McAfee was seated there and recognised her as a young woman who had waited on her in March last and told her that she had a letter of introduction to her from Scotland. The letter was not, however, forthcoming, and Mrs. Strong declined to have anything to do with her. When confronted with Mrs. Strong at Mr. Kidson's, she denied have ever seen Mrs. Strong before. She was foolishly enough allowed to depart, and after victimising a tailor named Adams in Russell Street by representing that she wanted additional money to purchase some building society shares, which the Reverend Charles Strong had advised her to buy, she was next heard of in Gippsland. She informed Mr Adams that she'd only arrived by the John Elder from Scotland and that she would send him a valuable piano as security for the money, four pounds, which she borrowed, in inverted commas. The first place in Gippsland she went to was Sale and after flitting about that town for some days went to Warrigal, where she again represented herself as the niece of Mrs Strong and sister to Mr Stewart, MA of Ormond College. She was welcomed there as hardly as she'd been in other places and was escorted about by several young bank officials. By this time, however, Detective O'Donnell had got on her track and some information sent to Warrigal by that officer caused her to leave hurriedly for Morwell, where she was arrested yesterday by Constable Gilfeller, who brought her to Melbourne last night. She had succeeded in ingratiating herself into the confidence of the landlady of a hotel and was sewing when arrested. Although not of ladylike appearance, she possessed a good address and speaks with a broad Scottish accent. And on the 9th of December 1881, epitome of news. Mary McAfee, the young woman who was arrested in Gippsland for imposing upon a number of charitably inclined ladies and others, pleaded guilty to a charge of that nature preferred against her at the city court. Mrs Jane Adams, one of the victims of the accused blandishments, informed the bench that the girl called at her residence on the 3rd of November, stating she was a new arrival from Scotland and she had a piano from which she wished to dispose of, and after some further conversation, finally induced Mrs Adams to advance her a sum of money on the instrument. The accused then disappeared and she never saw her again. She subsequently learned from inquiries instituted that the supposed piano had no existence. As it was proved that the accused had successfully practised the same imposition on several other persons and had also served a sentence of six months despite her protestations of amendment, if discharged, the bench ordered her to be sent to jail for 12 months. So on the 25th of November 1881, there's an article that outlines this court case titled The Female Imposter. The city court was crowded today with persons engaged and subpoenaed in the case against the girl Mary McAfee who was arrested about a week back by Detective O'Donnell on several charges of imposition. The girl, when placed behind the bar, asked for a remand for a week. Probably she felt ashamed when she saw so many ladies and gentlemen in court whom she recognised as her victims. The girl, in speaking for herself, said something to the effect that she was unable to earn an honest living and as a companion who had met her in jail exposed her and she consequently lost every respectable situation. Mr Hill got into the witness box and gave a history of her for a long time past, proving a conviction for the larceny of some jewellery and wearing apparel. Mr Panton thought the girl more a subject for a lunatic asylum than a jail. Still, he was compelled to send her to the latter place for 12 months. And another article outlining the case begging under false representations. A respectable-looking and decently attired young woman named Mary McAfee, alias Maggie Stewart, who is said to have been brought out from Scotland some three or four years ago as an immigrant by the South Australian government, was brought up on remand at the city court on Friday, charged on the 3rd by obtaining a sum of £4 from Mrs Jane Adams of false representations. Under the cloak of religion and assumed religious associations, the prisoner had for some time past imposed upon simple-minded people in almost all the suburbs and at various country towns. Her victims were invariably Scotch people, as she made it a practice to assume a Glasgow accent and to talk grandiloquently of her acquaintance with persons high in the Presbyterian Church. Mr Panton said it was impossible for the prisoner to tell the truth. She imposed upon Mrs Adams by representing herself as the owner of a grand piano worth 70 guineas, which she stated she'd brought out from the old country with her, She stated she was shortly going to get married but was in want of money and did not like to let her right relations know of her condition. 
Mrs Adams advanced the money on the understanding that the piano should be sent to her house till the girl got married. The piano was a myth, as also were all the other fabulous and misleading stories told by this dishonest Scotch lassie. So she was received in Melbourne jail on the 25th of November 1881. In her time in jail on the 10th of January 1882, she was sent to solitary confinement for two days due to noisy conduct. She was then transferred to Sandhurst Jail, or Bendigo as it's known today, on the 9th of March 1892 and was found to have improper articles on her person on the 5th of June 1892 and was given three-day solitary confinement. She was released on the 16th of October 1882. And then, by the 2nd of December 1882, she features in an article in Deniloquent in southern New South Wales. Tommy R. Long was charged with stabbing a girl named Mary McAfee with intent to do grievous bodily harm. Mr. Edwards appeared for the prisoner. Sergeant Vaughan deposed. I arrested the prisoner on Saturday night in the kitchen at the Globe Hotel and charged him with stabbing a girl who was present. The fork produced was on the table near him. Cross-examined. I believe the prisoner has been at Mr. Atkinson's for some time and so has the girl. Mary McAfee deposed. I am a housemaid at the Globe Hotel. I know the prisoner. He was the cook at Globe Hotel. On Saturday night last I was in the kitchen. The prisoner and the chemist's boy were there. I went into the kitchen for some boiling water. The cook was talking to the chemist's boy and said it was four o'clock the day before when the dinner things came off the table. I said in a joke it will be six o'clock tomorrow before they come off. The cook had a fork in his hand and he attempted to strike me with it. I put my hand up to save myself. He struck me on the hand and inflicted the wounds now seen. I felt the fork go through the bone and it bled a great deal and was very painful. I saw Dr. Noyes afterwards and he advised me to poultice it. I don't want to prosecute. Tommy did not say he was sorry for what he'd done. He said he did not do it. If Tommy had apologised, I should have said nothing about it. I did not go to the police. I did not know that the police knew anything about it until after they came about a quarter of an hour afterwards. Tommy was in a bad temper all day. By the bench, I did not run against the fork. Mr Noyes deposed, I examined the last witness's hand on Saturday night and again yesterday morning. There were two small puncture wounds in the ball of the thumb. There had been considerable hemorrhage from them. A fork would have produced the wounds. Alfred Rogers deposed, I'm an apprentice to Mr Glyde Chemist. I was in the kitchen at the Globe Hotel on Saturday night about nine o'clock. The prisoner was there. He said the girl had cleaned the things off the table at four o'clock. The housemaid, Mary McAfee, was in the kitchen also. She said she would take the things off the table at six o'clock the next day. Prisoner ran at the girl with a fork. He made a blow at her breast. The girl threw out her arms to save herself and the fork went into her hand. The wound bled a good deal. The girl walked out of the kitchen holding her hand and the prisoner stood watching her. I told the prisoner that the girl's hand was bleeding and he said that he did not do it. The prisoner was then committed for trial and bail allowed in two sureties of £20 each. Next we hear of Mary McAfee is in the Victorian Police Gazette in 1883. Mary Robinson, alias McAfee, charged on warrant with obtaining goods by false pretenses from Rosa Zerhest at Echuca and has been arrested by Senior Constable Jamison at Mosgill Police and remanded to Echuca. So in May 1883, there was an article that stated that a smart capture has been made at Mosgill, New South Wales on information supplied by the Deniliquin policemen, Detective Hayes and Sergeant Wilkinson. Some time ago, a girl who gave her name as Robinson ingratiated herself so far with the tradespeople of Echuca that she was enabled to swindle them considerably. She told them that she was the niece of Reverend James MacArthur, who was a Presbyterian minister in Deniliquin for a time. She got into the good graces of Mrs Rosa Schrest at one time of the Continental Hotel Deniliquin. She informed Mrs Schrest that she was engaged to a gentleman in Deniliquin that she had a considerable sum in the bank and she was the niece of Reverend MacArthur. After a short negotiation, she went into partnership with Mrs. Shest, whom she victimised to a considerable extent. After some time, the imposter was exposed due to her inconsistent statements and the girl decamped. For some time, no trace of her could be found, 
but the Deniliquin police at last discovered she was identical to a Mrs McAfee who had played a part in the police court case at Deniliquin. And then they found out that she, along with another woman, had arrived at Pretty Pine, just northwest of Deniliquin, had arrived in a buggy early one morning from Moama. The other lady drove the buggy and McAfee took the coach passage to Hay. Information was sent to Hay and it was found she'd gone to Mosgiel under the name of Mrs Watson, who described herself as a governess where she had obtained employment on a station. The Mosgiel police were informed. The Deniliquin police, confident she was the same woman, as she stated she was a governess on previous occasions, had the young lady shadowed until the arrival of a warrant. She seemed to be about to put in place her old tricks as she produced a telegram that had been dispatched and received by a resident a few miles out of Deniliquin where she was asking him to forward her money at once. When the gentleman was questioned, he said he had never had a farthing belonging to her and never saw her more than once or twice in his life. She was arrested and taken to Echuca. On the 23rd of May 1883, she arrived in Echuca. On her arrival, she was accused by Mrs Wright of stealing several articles of jewellery from her residence in Moama previous to her trip to Mosgill. McAfee denied the theft, but being searched in the lockup was found to have a gold brooch and a gold ring that Mrs Wright claimed at once. Mrs Wright said she allowed the girl to stay at her house, not knowing her character until now. On the 29th of May 1883, she was brought up in the Echuca Court, charged with larceny from Mrs Shest, obtaining a piano from Mrs Cochrane by means of false pretenses and passing a valueless cheque. She was acquitted of the first offence and then committed for trial at Sandhurst Assizes on the second charge to be held in July. For the third offence, named as imposition, she received six months in Sandhurst Jail hard labour that same day. At the Sandhurst Assizes on the 17th of July 1883, she was found guilty of obtaining goods under false pretenses And having admitted two previous convictions, she was imprisoned for a term of three years and two weeks of the second and fourth months to be passed in solitary confinement. Cumulative on the sentence, she is now ongoing. In passing sentence, Justice Holroyd stated, You have pleaded guilty to obtaining a piano under false pretenses at Echuca, and the pretense adopted was of a most elaborate description. Your address is good, you appear to have good manners and decent behaviour, I don't wonder why you succeeded in deceiving people by your plausible stories. You have been convicted previously for stealing two cheques, and it also appears that you are undergoing a sentence at Echuca for other offences. I am very sorry that one so young and so apparently well-educated should be guilty of a criminal offence, but it is necessary that I should deal with your case with some severity. Mary was reported to have been very much affected with leaving the dock, and fell down when she entered the anteroom opening into the dock, needing to be carried out, her cries being audible for some time afterwards. Her jail record stated she was a teacher, sallow complexion, black hair, blue eyes, a pockmarked face with a scar on her cheek. On the 26th of July 1883, she was transferred to Melbourne Jail. On the 15th of January 1884, she was given three days solitary confinement for taking work from a fellow prisoner. And a further three days solitary confinement on the 11th of June 1885 for refusing to leave her cell when asked to. Mary was released from jail on the 19th of February 1886. On the 11th of August 1886, so approximately six months after her release, there is a marriage announcement. On the 30th of June, at Granite House Fitzroy, by Reverend John Alexander Dowie, James Grant Butcher, Middle Brighton, to Mary McAfee, second youngest daughter of William McAfee, timber merchant, Southside, Glasgow, and sister to the Reverend Alexander McAfee, St Andrew's Church, Paisley, near Glasgow. And in the marriage record, she lists her name as Mary Jane Muirhead McAfee. And that's the first and only time that we see Muirhead included in a name. So several months later, late November 1886, an article appears in the paper, an audacious female imposter. The bench at Fitzroy were engaged for upwards of three hours yesterday investigating cases in which a female named Mary Jane Grant was charged with obtaining money and goods by means of false representations. In the first case, the prisoner was charged with obtaining from August Fettling, watchmaker and jeweller of Brunswick, an eight-day clock, 
a gold watch, two sets of bracelets, two pairs of earrings and other articles valued at £27. She told Mr Fettling that she had just purchased land at Coburg, for which she'd paid £750, and that she was about immediately to erect three cottages in a villa. She mentioned the name of the architect, the contractor, who she said was to be employed to carry out the work. She invited Mr Fettling to accompany her to Coburg to see the land. He accepted the invitation, and on reaching the Coburg Hotel, she pointed out some land to him as that to which she had bought. On returning to Brunswick, she gave Mr Fettling three cheques and directed that the articles which she had purchased should be sent to her residence in Heidelberg Road, Fitzroy. All this took place on Monday the 15th of November. The cheques on being presented at the bank were dishonoured. Mr Fettling then drove to the house on Heidelberg Road and found that the woman had left. He then placed the matter in the hands of the police and after some time the prisoner was arrested. In the second case, the prisoner was charged with obtaining £30 in money from Mrs Maria Smith, a widow, carrying on a business as a draper on the Heidelberg Road, North Fitzroy. The evidence went to show that the prisoner called on Mrs Smith on Monday the 1st of November and purchased some goods for which she paid cash. A day or two after, she called again and purchased more goods and in the course of the conversation said she owned a house in Moore Street, Fitzroy, which she wished to dispose of. She said it was valued at £800 and that she would sell it for that price and would take a £20 deposit and the balance of £1 per month. Mrs Smith agreed to the purchase. She accompanied the prisoner to the offices of Mr McKean and Leonard, where some instructions were given by the prisoner to prepare the transfer deeds. Mrs Smith then advanced £20 by way of deposit on the purchase and subsequently gave the prisoner £11 to pay accounts from which she said she owed. Mrs Smith subsequently ascertained that the prisoner owned no property in Moore Street. She then placed the matter in the hands of the police. The third charge was for obtaining from George Davies, pawnbroker Brunswick Street, Fitzroy, three lustres, one ring, two pictures and a locket by means of a valueless cheque. The prisoner was committed to take her trial on all three charges at the criminal sessions to be held on the 1st of December, bail being accepted in two sureties of £100 each and the prisoner herself £200. Mary received two years in Melbourne jail on the 1st of December 1886 and she was released on the 30th of November 1888. Barely four months later, on the 6th of February 1889, Frauds by a woman at Hawthorne. Sentence of two years imprisonment. At the Hawthorne court on Tuesday, a respectably dressed woman named Mary Ann Grant was charged with obtaining goods to the value of £143, 6 shillings and 4 pence from Charles G. Amore, furniture dealer of Burwood Road. Mr Wesley prosecuted. The prosecutor gave evidence that the prisoner called upon him on the 22nd January with a female friend and intimated that she had recently come from Scotland, intended opening a boarding school and therefore wished to furnish nine or ten rooms. She stated in answer to an inquiry that the transaction with him would be a cash one, as she had £300 in the National Bank at Melbourne, which she intended to transfer to the Hawthorne branch. She selected furniture to the value of £138 and six shillings, which he ordered to be forwarded to a house in Camberwell, where he delivered it, but as it transpired, she had some trouble with the agents of the house. He the next day removed the furniture to a house at Hawthorne. She promised to see him to settle the account, but failed to do so, and subsequently gave him a cheque, which was on presentation returned marked no account. The lady friend of the prisoner afterwards brought him the key of the house, where the furniture had been delivered, and told him the woman was a swindler, having just come out of jail. He had recovered his furniture. She had been six times previously convicted for imposition, vagrancy and larceny. Colonel Barker of the Salvation Army stated that the prisoner was the daughter of wealthy parents in Scotland, but suffered from kleptomania. The bench sentenced her to two years imprisonment with hard labour. She was admitted to Melbourne Jail on the 5th of February 1889, and released on the 29th of August, 1890. Within several months, in November 1890, she was at it again, and this was a recollection that was published in the newspaper in 1924 by a policeman talking about his notable cases. And it says, Mary McAfee, alias Grant, alias Gordon, 
Melbourne's greatest female swindler of the age. During the afternoon of November 20th, 1890, a Mr Ramsey, then a well-known Collins Street merchant, met me in Little Collins Street and said, you are just the man I wanted to see. Mr Ramsey was a canny Scotchman who in business matters was not likely to be easily hoodwinked. He informed me that there was a lady customer of his in Gertrude Street Fitzroy, a Mrs Carlton, who kept a drapery shop. A few weeks previously, she advertised a room to let, which was taken by a little lady of about 30 years old, named Miss Gordon. She'd not been there many days before she took a great liking to Mrs Carlton and her little daughter, aged 12. Miss Gordon, he said, owned a great deal of property at St Kilda and showed Mrs Carlton several big terraces and some cottages, which she said belonged to her. She was transferring the title of one of the cottages as a deed of gift to Mrs Carlton's little girl and another to Mrs Carlton. They had been to her solicitors with her and she was to get the deeds from her bank, take them to the solicitor and make the transfer an accomplished fact. With Mrs Carlton in her company, she called on some of the tenants in the terraces she owned who were behind with their rent and warned them that if they did not pay up at once, she would put in the bailiffs. I asked if Mrs Carlton actually heard what she said to the tenants. Oh no, he said. Mrs Carlton remained in the street while she spoke to the tenants. Then I said, for all that Mrs Carlton knows, she might have simply asked if Mrs Jones lived there. Mr Ramsey said, that is so. He went on, however, to inform me that the altruistic lodger accompanied Mrs Carlton to Flinders Lane warehouses, where Mrs Carlton dealt purchased for and presented to her a seal skin coat of great value and also bought similar articles for herself. He said, the whole thing is either an act of the most fulsome and spontaneous generosity I've ever heard of or it's a swindle, but I cannot see where the swindle comes from. Mrs Carlton got a detective to see Miss Gordon, but he said he did not know her. And I said, how did she pay for the goods at the warehouses? Mr Ramsey said, by cheque, every time. I said, is she Scotch? Mr Ramsey said, she speaks broader Scotch than I do. And I said, does she take stuff? He said, yes, in enormous quantities. I said, I know her. She's an out-and-out swindler. Mr Ramsey was staggered. Just at that instant, up came a lady, accompanied by a little girl of 12. She was fashionably dressed and wore the sealskin coat she had purchased in the lane. She touched Mr Ramsey on the arm and he turned to speak to her. She was Mary McAfee, alias Grant, the very woman we'd been speaking about. She did not notice who I was and to prevent her from doing so, I pretended to see something very interesting in a shop window on the opposite side of the street. By looking in a shop window, one can hide one's face and see all that goes on behind him. As soon as she left Mr Ramsey, I hastened to him and said, "'Is that the woman?' He said it was. I said, that is enough for me. I am going to arrest her straight away. I followed her to the office of Mr. Sincock's solicitor, Normanby Chambers, Chancery Lane. And when she came out, I said, well, Mary, you are up to your old game again. She was dumbfounded. I took her and the little girl to the watch house. After charging Mary McAfee, alias Grant, alias Gordon, with vagrancy just to hold her, I restored the child to her mother. The evening papers of November 29th had a full account of the arrest and the next day I was simply overwhelmed by complainants who had been victimised by her and had sufficient of valueless checks she passed on to business people handed to me to paper a house. She was sent for trial on 16 charges of forgery, uttering and obtaining money on false pretenses and on being found guilty received sentences totalling about seven years. She had a long list of prior convictions recorded against her, all of which she pleaded guilty. At the time she engaged the room at Mrs Carlton, she was not long out of jail. Mrs Carlton was, as a businesswoman, ruined by her conduct. Her credit in the warehouses was completely destroyed. It was on the strength of her being in Mrs Carlton's company that the firms cashed her valueless checks. Mary McAfee, alias Gordon, alias Grant, had obtained in cash from Mrs Carlton through her feigned generosity about £40 and the unfortunate lady was compelled to file her schedule for bankruptcy. And on the 13th of December 1890, criminal sittings of the Supreme Court will be open Monday next and the following list of prisoners for trial as follows Mary McAfee false pretenses. She was charged in the Melbourne Supreme Court on the 12th of December 1890 for seven counts of false pretenses. 
She received 10 months on each count, cumulative, so 70 months in total, 5 years and 10 months. Her occupation was listed as a tailoress. She'd had five previous convictions by this point. In this record, she'd stated she was born in 1861. She was admitted to Melbourne Jail on the 15th of December 1890 and was released on the 13th of June 1895. The next she appears is on the 23rd of April 1896. Mary Grant, alias McAfee, was arrested by Constable McCaig at Frankston on the 17th of April, on warrant charged with larceny from a dwelling at North Melbourne on the 2nd of January. So seven months after she was released, she was caught out on a charge from from the January. It says she was discharged from the Melbourne jail on the 5th of June last year after undergoing a sentence of five years for false pretenses on seven counts. She was brought before Mr J Thompson JP and remanded to appear at North Melbourne on the 23rd. On the 29th of June 1898, it's titled A Female Thief. A married woman named Elizabeth Dickens, alias Mary Grant, was charged at Collingwood Court on Monday for stealing a gold ring. On the 6th of May, she called into Dancer's Shop, 196 Johnston Street, and said she was requiring plumbing work done at her premises at St Kilda, and whilst there, lifted the ring from the mantelpiece. She pawned it for six shillings on the same day. Sergeant Irwin stated that the accused had served a total period of 15 years and three months in sentences since 1881, the offences including imposition and larceny. She was presently undergoing a sentence. The accused pleaded guilty but appealed for a light sentence. Since 1895, she had contrived to keep away from crime, excepting on one occasion when she was ordered a month's imprisonment. Her father was well-to-do in Scotland and it was intended by a relative to send her home after her release from jail. She received a sentence of three months' imprisonment. And at the same time in 1898, there was a reference again to what she was up to and there was a quote saying, She is one of the worst criminals in Melbourne, Your Worship, which was a statement of Senior Constable Hibbard in the Fitzroy bench today in the case of a woman named Mary Grant charged with stealing a gold watch and chain. On the 16th, the accused called at a restaurant in Gertrude Street and asked to be served with some refreshments in a private room. When she left with a gold watch and chain, valued at three pounds, the property of Charlotte Cooper, a waitress, it was found missing. On the same day, the accused pawned the articles for 21 shillings. The above facts have been sworn to the accused who had a formidable list of prior convictions and was sentenced to jail for three months. So even though she was in jail and under sentence, things kept popping up and it kept being added on to. So she was admitted again to jail on the 20th of June 1898 and again on the 18th of July 1898, there's another case. She pawned them is the title, gets a month. Mary Grant was charged before the Paran Court today with stealing a gold brooch, a silver necklet and locket, a silver bracelet and some wearing apparel from the property of Mrs Wilkinson, boarding house keeper in Nicholson Street, South Yarra, on the 27th of April. The prosecutor stated that the accused came to her house and asked if she could be accommodated. The witness allowed her to remain and the next morning she came into the prisoner's room and seeing a brooch without a pin so that she would take it to a jeweller's to have the pin put back in. She also asked, what other jewellery have you got? Shortly after, the accused left the house and the jewellery was missed. The brooch was pawned and the bench sentenced her to one month's imprisonment. So as a result of all of those, Mary was finally released on the 4th of January 1899. Now, at this time, there is a birth record for a Jesse Dunsmore Grant and also a Jesse Dunsmore McAfee, both born in Victoria in 1898. They have the same registration number, so same child but different surnames and registered under the same number but two separate registrations. Her mother is listed as Mary McAfee, although a father not listed. If this is indeed Mary McAfee's child, I suspect that James Grant and Mary had separated at some stage, even very early, particularly if he's soon realised that she was a swindler and she was being caught and incarcerated so often, pretty much as soon as after their marriage occurred. 
So it's quite likely that although Jessie was born with the name Grant, that the James Grant's not her father, but Mary, still being a married woman, had to use James's name. Jessie married Robert Griffith Humphreys in 1919 in Victoria. Robert was a carpenter and they lived in Coburg and they had five children. Roy, Margaret or Peggy as she was known, who was living in the USA in the 1950s, David, Dawn and Robert Jr. And these are the only known descendants of Mary McAfee. Jessie died in 1953, aged 54 years in Fitzroy. Now, owing to the fact that Mary was incarcerated so often, I'm wondering whether Jessie may have been brought up with a friend. I couldn't find any record of a, a Jessie Grant or a Jessie McAfee being placed into the foster system. By the 14th of November 1900, again, we have another conviction in Ballarat. At the City Police Court on Tuesday, Mary McAfee, alias Mary Sinclair, who acknowledged numerous prior convictions, was sentenced to two years imprisonment for larceny and imposition. So her child would have been two at this point. And in 1903, Robert Arnott's housebreaking, the diamond and sapphire ring and the gold band ring, have been recovered and traced to the possession of Mary McAfee, who was arrested by the Melbourne CI Police. On the 22nd of August 1904, Annie Austin is charged on warrant with imposition on Thomas Gray Redmond, a carpenter, at 32 Derby Street, Collingwood. On the 12th, description, Scotch, 43 years old, 5 foot and a half inches high, thin build, black hair turning grey, blue eyes, front teeth missing, wore a black dress, brown cape and black hat, identical with Mary McAfee. The 24th of September 1904, so only a month later, a noted character is the article's title. The police have gained further information concerning the woman Bowman, now under arrest for imposition. She was, it is alleged, recently before the Collingwood bench for the larceny under the name of Annie Austin and absconded from her bail. There is also another warrant out against her at Collingwood for imposition. The Superintendent of Police, Mr Charles, has received information that the woman now under arrest on a charge of imposing in Geelong and District is identical with the woman wanted by Metropolitan Police for absconding from bail at Collingwood and failing to answer two charges of larceny in the name of Mary Austin, also for imposition in the name of Annie Austin. On the 23rd of September 1904, an old offender, Geelong, The woman giving the name of Mary A. Bowman, who was arrested in the previous evening for victimising a number of people in Geelong and District, appeared at the Geelong Police Court this morning, charged with being a rogue and a vagabond, and on the application of the police was remanded to appear Tuesday next. She's an old offender and has quite an interesting and romantic career. Superintendent Charles had identified her as being a woman who'd been convicted under eight or nine different aliases. She came to Victoria from Glasgow in 1881. She visited various prominent clergymen in different parts of Victoria and whilst waiting in the different houses would empty the card trays into a receptacle and subsequently use the cards thus obtained as a means of further introductions to the persons whose names they bore. Any knickknacks about the place would be confiscated and for some of these offences she received a sentence in the name of Mary McAfee. Her last conviction was under the name of Mary Grant for theft some time back and it's only recently that she was released from prison. Several charges including that of larceny as a bailee, imposition etc are to be preferred against her Tuesday next. And another article related to what she had got up to in Geelong on the 28th of September 1904. Geelong, a female imposter's record. The woman who succeeded in passing valueless checks upon residents of the Geelong district after negotiating with them for the purchase of real estate was proceeded against at the police court on Tuesday in the name of Mary Ann Bowman, alias Mary Sinclair, alias Mary McAfee, alias Mary Grant. She was presented on three charges of imposition and one of larceny as a bailee. Augustina Rao, gave evidence that the accused called on her place at Germantown on the 19th and after some conversation agreed to purchase witnesses property for £325. She tendered a valueless cheque for £70 as a deposit. 
The woman pleaded guilty and admitted the following previous convictions. Melbourne, 1881, one year and six months. Bendigo, 1883, three years and six months. Melbourne, 1886, two years. Hamilton, 1889, two years. Ballarat, 1892, years and three months. Melbourne, 1890, five years and ten months. The bench expressed the opinion that the woman would be better in jail than out of it and sentenced her to three years imprisonment. And another article, an incorrigible woman, after bearing the evidence of Sergeant Hall, who prosecuted and stated that the woman had served 17 years in jail out of 23 years. And that's when the trial goes cold. So the assumption is she would have been released in 1907. And so at this stage, in 1907, Mary McAfee would have been 47. And from that point on, I found it very difficult to find anything on her, including a a death. So a very interesting woman and her rap sheet being so long, it is quite likely that she may have even vacated Australia and returned to Scotland. So that's uh, another little mystery that could very well have a further bonus episode down the track when other information may come to light. If you are interested in sharing your story on my podcast, Family History Mysteries, please go to my Facebook page and send me a message. If you would like some assistance in filling in the gaps in your family tree to see what mysteries you solve, please get in touch. And don't forget you can have early access to episodes by subscribing and you'll also gain access to bonus episodes.